show to introduce you to the actors who are with us today. Um, we are starting with Zowie Ashton, who's here with a film called Velvet Buzzsaw. Hi. She's an English actor and director, and she's a new face to a lot of people in the US, uh, but I think you'll be seeing a lot more of her. Um, next to Zowie is Griffin Gluck, who's here with the movie Big Time Adolescence. You might know her from just know him from Just Go With It or American Vandal. He is, uh, I think, the youngest person on our panel. This is his first Sundance. Welcome. Uh, sitting next to uh, Griffin is Rian Barreto, who is here with the movie Share. She's in every scene of the movie. Also someone who might be kind of a new face to you. She's also in the um, upcoming series Hannah on Amazon. Uh, get to know her. Uh, sitting next to Rihanna is someone you probably know pretty well, David Oyelowo. You may know him from Selma. Or United Kingdom or King of Katwe. He's here with the movie Relive, which he also produced. Um, welcome, David. Uh, sitting next to David is Jillian Bell. Uh, you, you may know her from Workaholics or 22 Jump Street. She's here with the movie Britney Runs a Marathon. She is Britney. She did a lot of running. You're going to see it later this week. Um, sitting next to me is Jim Gaffigan. You may know him. <laughs> you may know him best from his stand-up work, which it's weird that laziness is a theme of your stand-up work because you're here with three movies. You seem to be quite busy. <laughs> um, the three movies are Troop Zero, Then That Follows, and Light From Light. So welcome, everyone. Welcome to our panel. I want to start off by asking, so who here is at their very first Sundance on the panel? I know Griffin is, you have a lot of folks. So for those of you who've been to Sundance before, what is your one piece of advice for our newcomers? I would say uh, try and smoke crack. <laughs> uh, it'll make you more confident. Um, you'll get along with people. But other than that, no, no, don't. We're gonna, we're gonna take. Yeah. David, do you have <laughs> a similar piece of advice, having been to many Sundays? Um, I'll, I'll just uh, jump on the end of that and yeah. say uh, thermals. Thermals. Uh, I'm wearing some now. I'm nice and toasty, and I feel lovely. Right. Right. Or, or long underwear, as Americans. Oh, that yeah. As we call. Oh, I yeah, see. Yeah. Long I, underwear oh, is, is ooh, a good wow. tip. Ooh, oh, nice. 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 Very good. <laughs> Um, to start off, a question about how you decide what kind of projects you'd like to do. Um, for some of you on the panel, you have been doing this for a while and you have some options. For other people, you're sort of just sort of breaking in. When you're looking at a script, Jillian, let's start with you. What makes you great? What, what makes you um, look at a script and say, OK, this is something I want to sign on to. I want to get aboard. Uh, this was my first real drama and or dramedy mm -hmm. and it wasn't like anything I've ever done before I usually do comedies playing insane women which I love mm -hmm. uh, but this one had a lot of heart and I related to the character a lot and I just thought it was a beautiful script at first it terrified me <laughs> and then I read it a couple more times and I was like I really want to do this mm -hmm. and I was lucky enough to get to do it mm -hmm. Um, Zowie, I remember when you and I were talking upstairs, you said you had kind of decided that you were going to not act anymore. You were maybe interested in directing when you got this role in Velvet Buzzsaw, which brings you here today. Yeah. So what, tell us a little bit about that and, and, and what was going through your mind when you read that script and thought about that film. It was one of the best scripts I've ever read, hands down. I, the reason why I wanted to maybe stop acting is I started when I was six. So this is my 28th year as an actor. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you. Um, so uh, externally, I'm a newcomer, but internally, I'm very much ready for someone to throw me a retirement party. Um, so it was just, I just had a moment where I just thought directing is what I want to do. Uh, if I'm not going to Sundance Film Festival with films, then I should just direct. And then this script came across my path, as is always the way, usually, when you have decided to step away from something. Something very magical sometimes happens. And Dan Gilroy has just written something so strange and funny and uh, complex about the relationship between art and commerce. 
it was I just couldn't put it down it, it was so um, it, it was so visceral the experience of reading it which I'm terrible at reading scripts like I would read the script for friends and be like it'll never work 20 <laughs> somethings in a flat ah. um, but reading this I just knew that I just I knew that I was coming back into the the game if I'd got the role and I and I got it so I'm here Griffin, kind of like Zhao, you've been acting, you're sort of transitioning now from being a child actor yeah. to being a grown-up actor. It's a, it's a, is considered a grown-up, that's crazy. Yeah, well it is actually, <laughs> technically, literally it is. Um, <laughs> so, uh, what went into your thinking in Big Time Adolescence? What was that casting process like? Um, it was, well, first off, as soon as I read the script, it was sort of the same sensation where it was like I couldn't put it down. And uh, Thomas, my friend who's actually sitting right here, I've been working with him forever, and he was attached to the project. And that kind of sweetened the deal. Um, the director, Jason, fantastic guy. It was just kind of like the dream project. It was everything I wanted to do. It was something new, something challenging, something I hadn't done before. So, I mean, how could I say now? I was like, please. Rianne, I know in, in the case of your movie, there was this really long casting process for it um, that started in the US. Your English, ultimately the director, found you and you guys ended up shooting in, in Canada. Can you talk to us a little bit about your casting process on that movie? Um, yeah, well, I, you, I, I just kind of left school um, thinking I'm not going to work ever. <laughs> and then I got this email and it was like, filming in New York girl is like lead role and I was like no one's gonna watch this no one's gonna press play um, so I did it sent it out and then I had to do it again the next day and then skyped and then I she mentioned improvising in the skype we talked about food a lot but improv came up and um, so I improvised a scene and sent it to my agent like if it's good send it if not don't because that's dodgy um, <laughs> And then afterwards, she flew to meet me, and then we just ate fish and chips and watched like great films and heard nothing. I thought maybe I just made a friend. And, <laughs> and, then, and then she called me at 1 a.m. I came down from Manchester from an audition that I didn't get. Um, and I was like, yeah, let's talk about The Shining. Um, and it ended up being her telling me that I got the role and I couldn't sleep because I was scared that if I woke up, it would be a dream. Um, so yeah, that was crazy, but yeah, really good. Um, <laughs> so when, when you say press play, you mean press play on your audition that you had put on tape? Yeah, which is kind of weird because the film's about videos, so that's, yeah, it's interesting. It's, it's interesting how much of sort of, I think people's popular idea of auditions is actors showing up at a place and reading, but that's really not how people do it anymore, is it? Yeah. Is everybody putting everything on tape now when yeah. they do it? And is what, David, you're making a face. Is that not how you do it? <laughs> um, no, I mean, uh, I, I'm, I'm about to direct a film and a lot of, that's how it starts. You know, right. you, get, you get the tapes come in. And you know, for me personally, as an actor, it's the, the most traumatizing thing is watching mm. other people's auditions because mm -hmm. literally the challenge I set myself with auditioning is that I will audition so hard and get so many roles that I never have to audition again. <laughs> I only want offers because it's such, you put yourself out there in such a, a huge way. And so now that I'm watching auditions of other actors, I'm just, but they're so good and I want to just say yes. and. Next. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm awful, I'm awful, I'm awful. You know, so, 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 so traumatic. When did you, as I mentioned, you produced the film that you have here at Sundance. When did you start producing and why? Um, well, basically, for, for me personally, and it goes back to why I choose the roles I do, I want to be scared, I want to be challenged, and the truth of the matter is that I want to play roles that defy the expectation and anticipation of who and what someone like me should get to play or has get, gotten to play historically. And I mean that as, as, a, as a black man living on planet Earth. And so um, a lot of the time, the material I would get, certainly earlier on in my career, was exactly what I didn't want to do. And so producing um, was born out of the necessity of knowing what I wanted, not getting it um, coming through to me or, or getting those roles, and so therefore needing to create them. And um, 
what started to happen after a while, which is how Relive came into my world, is I bored people enough with saying, scare me, scare me, scare me. And with the fact that bring me things that, you know, I, I read this thing that was formative for me when I was younger, which was Denzel Washington, early in his career, said to his agent, send me everything that Harrison Ford is turning down. <laughs> and he kind of built the beginning of his career on, on that. And that just goes to tell you the kind of roles a black actor was getting then, and certainly was the case for me. And Relive was set in Ohio, written as a white guy, you know, nothing to do with someone who looks like me. And when, I, when it was sent to me, it scared me because the premise is incredibly layered. But also, you know, when it was going to be me, I said, let's shoot this in LA. We ended up shooting it in South Central. And the cast is far more diverse than it would have been otherwise. And that's something else that is a, a big priority of mine, is making sure that the world in the films that I do as a producer and an actor looks like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, one area where David's been really ahead of the curve is in working with female directors who are still really in, in small number, unfortunately. And it's interesting to see that that's still the case after we've talked about it in spaces like this for a long time. Um, what is the role, and this is for anyone, what is the role for an actor in conversations like that about inclusion? What, what can you do? What do you do? If anyone wants to tackle mm. that. Anyone have? Well, I would say similar to David, I, um, I look for roles for white guys, too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it, <laughs> there is, you know, the inclusion, it's interesting, you talk about female directors, but I would say of the last seven films I did, five of them were female directors. Yeah. So, uh, and so that's, in some ways, that, that's, that's more uh, the norm for what I've encountered. Yeah. Uh, but, I, you know, in, in talking about uh, inclusion, I don't know, it's weird because obviously, you know, uh, it, I did this film, Them That Follow, which is, you know, an, uh, you know snake healers in Appalachia that really doesn't, you know, it has to be kind of like poor white people. You know what I mean? And then if you look at uh, what's so great about Troop Zero, which is something that has this, the, the cast is very diverse, but it's almost, I mean, this might be my takeaway. I feel like the film is a commentary on class mm -hmm. as opposed to, um, you know, races involved in everything in America. But it's, so like that was, again, directed by Bert and Bertie, two women. So it's, you know, the, the inclusion, it's weird, because that's all I know is this, uh, maybe because I've only gotten jobs for two years, but uh, <laughs> is, is the inclusion. But, uh, well, that's, that's great to hear. One thing um, that a lot of you have in common on this panel is that you have live experience, either as a stand-up, in Groundlings, doing theater. And I'm curious, what do you think that helps you with when you get to a film set? Maybe Jillian, you can talk a little bit about coming from the improv world. You know, usually the films I do, like I said, are comedies. So uh, they look for that. They're hoping for you to come. And we usually do the scene two times as is. And then you they just let you run and improvise a ton. And I do love that. And this was the first film where I didn't have that as much. You know, the director. Uh, is also the writer, and he was like, I think it'd be interesting to try to just stick to the script. And if there's anything where we feel <laughs> like, and I'm like, hmm, that's interesting. Um, no, no, but it was a beautiful script, and I was almost scared to improvise yeah. in that scenario, because he had written her so well, he, he knew her personally. It was based off of a real uh, woman, mm -hmm. um, who was his best friend and roommate back in the day. So. Um, for this, it was the first time I was sort of just like, I, I was sort of stripped from that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I actually really liked it. I thought I would be terrified because, you know, if you're so comfortable in something, I'm so used to being comfortable going and improvising and if the cameraman's shaking, you know you're doing a good job. Mm -hmm. But with this, I was like, are we, was it good? <laughs> like you're crying. Yeah. You're like, did we do it? Did we get it? Yeah, yeah. no. Uh, 
So yeah, I had to rely on the director a lot. Is that, Jim, I mean, well, when- You know, I think uh, doing comedy or even doing a live performance, obviously there's no fourth wall, but uh, you know, the three films I have here are dramas and uh, I, I don't know, I think that uh, doing a comedy is fun, but uh, it's not the same concentration that's required in a drama. Whereas like when you're, when you're doing a comedy, we're horsing around, you know, the camera guy is, you know, laughing, you know, whereas in a drama, you're like, you know, you're involved with the crew and there's almost kind of, you're dealing with this moment of grief and they're, they're respectful of the grief that you're going through, but it's hard to measure it because as comedians, you're spoiled by feedback, right. particularly with live performance, there's the immediate feedback. Mm. So, but I love the dramas, you know, it's, I find it more rewarding actually. Hmm. So you've done a lot of theater and you also, I know, have done some like poetry slams and, yeah. and similarly in an environment where you get a lot of audience feedback. What yeah. do you bring from that when you're doing a film or a TV show? I think the main thing that live performance gives me personally is this, uh, you, have, you have to work from the inside out rather than the outside in. When you start doing film, you realize just how many departments there are who are going to make you look amazing. There is a whole video village, like there's a DOP who's going to make things look exciting and dynamic and there's hair and makeup and wardrobe and sparks and, uh, and there's people doing so many different incredible jobs to build the whole picture that you kind of enter into when you start the job. You know, people have been going for months, usually before you arrive on film. Um, and I feel like sometimes that can get me into a habit of being a little more self-conscious. You know, what's the shot? What am I doing? How am I lit? Um, uh, 10 different things, you know, where, where am I looking? Am I looking at this tiny bit of green tape over plastered on a wall rather than someone's face? Okay, I'm gonna try and invent that person from, from my imagination. Whereas in theater, as soon as you walk out on that stage, it is so bald and it is so raw. If you don't have a character, you will just, you will just fall over. Mm. Like you'll just be like a cardboard cutout. Mm. You'll just go like that because there's no frills. And so it's always like really delightful when you go maybe from doing a play and you've worked a character so much from the inside and you know everything about them, you know their past, you know their history. And then you go into a film where the pressure's off a little bit, but you still have all of that bubbling inside. I always find it really, um, really satisfying when I go on a film set and I'm still working that that character muscle mm. rather than getting involved in all the other stuff, which, you know, is brilliant, but it, you can find yourself sometimes acting from like the navel up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that's just me. Maybe I'm just a very lazy actor. <laughs> no, I'm, well, let's talk about finding a character. Uh, Rianne, I know that for your film, you play an American teenage girl. You're English. She's a basketball player. Did you play that? No. We don't have it. We do netball. Netball. Which is not basketball. <laughs> you don't move when you have the ball, so it's very different. Um, but I did tell them, I was a bit sneaky. I was like, yeah, I'm familiar with balls. I did netball. <laughs> and it, and it, <laughs> it came out really well. <laughs> but it's very, that, got you the that was really, <laughs> that's not a good, yeah, that was bad. But, um, Clickbait. Yeah. <laughs> You've just outed me. <laughs> um, so yeah, I can't remember the question because I. Well, <laughs> finding your character. Yes. Was it helpful to you as you were trying to figure out who this girl is and how you were going to play her to learn to play basketball, to m master the accent? Were those part of the things that helped you? Right. Yeah. Because yes, um, it's weird. Like I would watch Hollywood Reporter roundtables to prepare. While I was doing press ups and playing basketball, I would like listen to the American accent more than I'd hear my mum talk to me or like my siblings, because I don't leave the house. Um, <laughs> so it was a lot of listening to like my favourite murder and like tri like crime podcasts. Um, because my character, oh, I don't want to spoil anything, but it was just more about realizing what I'd lose as an American than 
than what actually happens because I just had to, with film, it's very different. I had to, I only could know what the video looked like when we'd done the shoot of the video and nothing had happened until I stepped onto that set. So I couldn't prepare in that way and also the director asked me not to, to just learn in America, to be American, which I'm very much not. <laughs> uh, well, you fooled me. You did. I did? Yeah. Thank Good you. you. <laughs> um, Griffin, in your film, you play a kid who's kind of going through a transition where he's realizing someone he looks up to is maybe not someone he should look up to. Yeah. Uh, tell, tell us a little bit about how you got to know this character and sort of start to understand him. Um, well, I had a lot of conversations with the director, uh, Jason, about this, and him and I got along. He answered like every question I had, and for me, it's just useful to know everything you sort of can um, and get in that headspace. But I could also see a lot of myself in the character, which I find a lot of the times helps a lot because then you can kind of draw from somewhere more personal. And um, it's kind of fun to, you know, imagine your life if it wasn't the same and it was like this, how would it be? And then that's sort of where, you know, you draw, I, or me personally, I draw things from. Um, so, yeah, that's, uh, I kind of forgot the question. I'm running off two hours of sleep. <laughs> that's I'm so okay. sorry. You're doing great. You're doing great. Thank you. Um, well, you mentioned the conversations you had with your director. I'm curious, yeah. when you are talking to the director and you're not on the same page, maybe you get a note that doesn't make sense to you, mm. how do you handle that? Does anybody have experience with that and, and sort yeah. of how do I mean, I think, uh, for me personally, uh, you know, be, because I had the opportunity to have my own show where I was an executive producer and I had been on the other side of uh, you know, watching auditions and uh, having people question uh, something in this in a script, I was very um, aware of the value of showing up and being a good soldier on a film set, and uh, also being flexible. Because I, I was shocked when I was on the other side as an executive producer, some of the demands or some of the unnecessary stubbornness. So I was, you know, I think it's so fun to discover a character or the, to understand some of the motivations because often the, the uh, director you know, has written the script and sometimes they've thought of stuff and sometimes they haven't. But I think it's the, the actor's responsibility to, you know, to, you know, you, to be a good soldier. Mm -hmm. you know? And that was something I learned from having my own show. But uh, so I don't know. So I, I'm kind of like- So you roll with you, it, you take care I, I, I think you gotta, you know, you can have the debate, but in the end, it's the director's call. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. David, what do you think? Since you, you know you're going to be in that position of directing, what do you, how do you feel actors and directors best communicate? Well, I, I I completely agree with Jim on that. I think our our job as actors, and and I really learned this in the theatre, is to serve the character, serve the director, serve the audience. You're there as a servant, really, which is probably not a very popular thing to say <laughs> as, a, as, a, as an actor uh, in Hollywood. Um, but, uh, but, but that is actually the job. Now, having said that, there have been instances for me where you can tell a director is at sea and they are lost and maybe they have stuff going on politically, the money's fallen out or whatever. And as an actor, you feel the need to protect yourself. And it's the worst thing you can possibly have on a film where you feel like, okay, I've just got to survive this without looking bad. Mm -hmm. And that, that hasn't happened many times in, in my career personally, but th there are instances where it's, it's a miracle every time a film actually comes together, gets made, is actually makes sense, and then an <laughs> audience likes it. Um, yeah. um, and so well, you think of all the mitigating factors. So you, you know, sometimes that, that, that does happen. But going back to what we were talking about with theatre, I, I, I truly believe that that is, you know, even in this room now, there is something happening energetically between us and you that a different group of people, it would be a different energy and there would be a different atmosphere. And so you personally, I've learned in the theater to respond to that, that there are things that are going to happen by me being attentive and open and responsive and in a place of service to this. And a director who understands that, that's where the real, in my opinion, magic happens. So your performances that have surprised me have been when I've had a director take me to places I didn't anticipate, 
I didn't see in the script. Um, and then you watch the film and then an editor comes in and puts it together in ways that you also didn't anticipate. And they make you look way smarter than you actually are. <laughs> so, you know, giving yourself over to that process can reap beautiful dividends. Mm. When did uh, each of you know that you wanted to be an actor? What was the moment that you said, this is the gig for me? Hmm. I can go. Yeah. Oh, you about to go? Oh, God. No? OK. Um, <laughs> I, in um, England, we have like year six leavers productions and my sister was the lead of that production and somehow I got my hands on the script and like younger years play chorus like opera singer number six and mm. orphan number five um, and I'd learnt the whole script somehow as a child and someone went on holiday without telling the school and then the school went into meltdown frenzy like what are we gonna do um, and I stood up and was like, I know the script. <laughs> so, and then I just got on stage and was loud. And I think, at, like, when you're 11, any parent that can hear is like, she's, she's she got something. <laughs> Where it probably wasn't a good performance, but I was just very shouty. So um, I think that feeling of just like, I could do anything on this stage right now, um, but I'm going to obey the words. It was like this freedom to play in this kind of playground mm. um, that was very exciting for me as an 11 year old. So mm. yeah. Mm. What about you, Jim? Oh gosh. I, well, I was, I remember being in this restaurant, Chicken Unlimited. <laughs> uh, Wait, that's a real? It is a real place. Name so. of a restaurant? Yeah, <laughs> Chicken Unlimited. I don't think it exists anymore. I was <laughs> six, I was with my brother and my mom, and we had just seen a movie, and um, my mom said, what do you guys want to be when you grow up? And my brother said, I want to be a helicopter pilot, and I said, I want to be an actress. And, <laughs> and so, but I always wanted, but it was growing up in a small town in Indiana, it was such a pipe dream. It was such a, you know, my family had just finally gotten to the middle class, so like, saying I wanted to be an actor was the equivalent of saying I wanted to be an astronaut. It was right. just absurd. Right. So, but uh, that was, then I eventually learned that I wanted to be an actor. It takes a lot of courage to declare it, depending on where you're from and, and what your family's expectations are. I Absolutely. Think. Yeah. And I think there's a huge amount of freedom to it, especially when you're a child, because you're, you know, you're bursting with imagination anyway. And then you get to play these characters and you get to go to these places. And for me, I, you know, I did a play when I was quite young and uh, my mum came to see it and there was a scene in which I had to kiss this girl and my mum from the audience went, David! <laughs> <laughs> in the middle I was like, put her down! Put, ah, put, her, eh, put her down! Now, and I, I sort of looked over my shoulder and I had to keep going. Yeah. Amazing! <laughs> it was so liberating that it was like the only time I could disobey my mom. And, yeah. so, um, so, yeah, not quite Chicken Unlimited. But, but similar, yeah. very similar. <laughs> Jillian, what about you? Did you have a sort of moment where this I just became clear to you? I always wanted to be an actress. I, I love making people laugh. I love making my family laugh, doing weird bits. My sister and I made home videos from such a young age. We made Mannequin 3. Mm. <laughs> it's real weird. Because <laughs> my sister's the love interest for me. <laughs> but like, I had a hat on, a very large hat, and I was supposed to be like, my love, and I go to kiss her, and I just tilted the hat towards the camera so it looked like we were kissing. <laughs> and I go, you could hear me whisper, how long do we do this? Because <laughs> I hadn't been kissed yet, but I just, I loved it. I moved to LA when I was 18, which thank God my parents let me. And I auditioned for a, my first audition was a Kelly Osbourne music video. And I was like, I'm never coming back. <laughs> I want to do this with my life. I didn't get in the music video, but my dreams did not die there. They did, good for you. Um, one thing that's interesting about the films that are represented here is that they're from a range of distributors, um, some looking for distribution, some are streamers, some are more traditional. And I'm curious, from the standpoint of an actor, 
Do you think about how the movie will be watched? Does it matter to you whether it's a theater or someone watching at home? Griffin, you're shaking your head. What do you think? Well, to me personally, I mean, no. Because Big Time Adolescence, when I went into that movie, it had pretty much nothing attached. It was an indie film that wasn't guaranteed to go anywhere. And uh, finding out we made it to Sundance was like the biggest deal to me. Um, and I, have, I still have no clue where it's going to go. Where should, I mean. Yeah, that's one of the acquisitions. It's one of the acquisitions. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it's kind of exciting, you know? If you love the script, and um, it's, which I did, and the script was such a passion project, um, it doesn't really matter, to me at mm -hmm. least, mm -hmm. because you get to have fun doing it, and then people get to see your work, which is just the best feeling ever. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, unless they hate it. <laughs> <laughs> David, what about as a producer? How do you evaluate these? I wish options? I was still like you. <laughs> <laughs> so lovely. Yes. I don't care where it goes. Let's see. Let's have fun. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, so lovely. Um, I Never really care it. where it goes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, no. The, the truth of the matter is, we are at a, an amazing time in our business where. There are so many ways to watch content. There are so many ways to find films. You know, I've had films that didn't do so great theatrically, but did huge streaming. And you go all over the world, and people have seen the film. And at the end of the day, that's what you want. Now, I'm not going to lie and say everyone doesn't want the brass ring of, oh, it did that at the box office, and all that kind of stuff. Because as a producer, that's what enables you to do another one, and mm -hmm. another one, and another one. Maybe do them on a bigger scale, you know. So, but at the end of the day, the dirty little secret as an actor is that you just want to tell stories. You just want to be moved, and hopefully that moves other people. Mm -hmm. And the more you can get back to that, the greater the chance you'll actually do that. Our business is very bad at, at nurturing that, mm -hmm. but I do think some of the new <laughs> Uh, places that are putting work out have figured out that to nurture artists, to enable them to have creativity and let them go do their thing is actually creating better work. And that's an amazing thing for us as actors, producers, directors, and writers. Yeah, yeah Jim, how do you look at it? Well, I think it's, it depends on the, the situation and the project. I mean, I personally, um, my, for me as an actor, I feel like I've spent the last 20 years attempting to prove that I can act. So it does really matter where it goes and if people see it. So uh, whether it ends up on a streaming service, it also depends which streaming service, because one of them, which starts with an A, has a big theatrical release. So that's different from it just ending up on their streaming service immediately. But I don't know. For me, I feel like I'm always attempting to uh, prove that I can act mm -hmm. as a comedian uh, working against that kind of um, uh, perception. And so I, you know, I want movies to come out. I also want them on airplanes, because I travel so much, and that's when I get to consume <laughs> things. So I'm like, get it on an airplane. Because even if it's on Netflix or Amazon Prime, it's like people have to make a commitment to look for it. Whereas when you're on an airplane, it's right there. And, you're like, all right, I want to watch this. Mm. <laughs> it's interesting to hear you say that you've spent these years proving that you can act. What, what does that look like for you? Well, look, I'm very grateful uh, to have the, but I've also been doing this for so long. And uh, I was in a film, I think it was in Tribeca in 2005, that, uh, which was um, Great New Wonderful, which was a drama. And uh, Tony Shalhoub was in it, Maggie Gyllenhaal, and, it was, and I was like, finally, I've proven that I can act. And it, it was bad timing. It was about 9-11, the year after 9-11, and essentially people were like, too soon. So it got buried. And so proving that I can act, that's why I'm so excited for people to see Light from Light or Troop Zero, because selfishly, as an actor, I want the great roles. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I want, that's why I care whether they're released in a, a theater or on a mm. streaming service. Eventually, I would definitely want them on a streaming service. It's such a, a balance between art and business, what you guys do for a living. Um, Jillian, how do you sort of think of those two things in your head when you're mapping out your own career and your own sort of ambitions? What does that look like for you? It's tough. I, I feel like 
uh, I'm going to say with age, but I'm, you know, I don't mean it like I'm some old woman, but I, I, I'm, I feel like I've been more like, what do you want to do? Like, what is it that you want to put out there? What do you want, hopefully, people to remember you by? Um, and it ranges from this character that I just did that completely changed my life to like playing a witch in a movie. Like I would love to do that. You know, I want to play someone big and bold <coughs> and fearless and just f funny, powerful women. And and being able to do this drama, I, I hope it gets to change my career a little bit and opens it up uh, to more opportunities. That's what I'm hoping. But yeah, you constantly have to think like, what what will anyone want to see me do? And usually it's the same type of thing you've already done. Mm -hmm. And it's about trying to be smart and not always choose that because it is easy to do. Um, and just looking for things that change up the path of your career. Mm -hmm. What was it about, you said playing Britney changed your life. The actual playing of it, what was it? One, doing a drama, getting mm -hmm. to do that. Um, I didn't know, to be honest, if I would like it. I've, I've always been scared of it, mm -hmm. and I really enjoyed it. It's so different, like you said, yeah. and um, rewarding. Uh, but I also, for the film, like they did not ask me to, but I wanted to do the journey of the character, and throughout the film, she loses 40 pounds. Mm -hmm. So I did that, and it was physically very challenging. Yeah, I bet. Um, but I wanted to be able to say I, I did as much as she did during the film and, mm -hmm. and relate to the character because I already did on such a base level. Mm -hmm. um, and just doing something sort of uh, empowering and challenging, mm -hmm. mentally, physically, and definitely emotionally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you all so much for being here with us today. Thank you, guys. Thank you.